Welcome back to the Meaningful People podcast. This episode, we have Charlene Amanoff, and we got to talk to her so much more than just the famous Golly's drowning story. We got to dig deeper into that story and the Amanoff life. Yeah, and as you guys can probably still see, Yako and I are still quarantined. So we're doing this intro and this outro from home, but we're dressing to kill. Yes, I. <laughs> if anyone knows uh, where I can rent tuxedos, I would love to have that. And yeah, this episode, it, it, was, it was a lot of things. It was fun, it was spiritual. I, I got goosebumps a few times. It was very, it was very, it was very emotional at times. There are some things that you're going to learn, um, specifically about the story of of Gali Amanov and the story of her drowning, and uh, that you probably didn't know about, even if you did hear, hear the story when when Charlene told it over other places. Without further ado, here is the Charlene Amanov story. Welcome to the Meaningful People Podcast, the podcast where we talk to people who are... Meaningful. Yeah, that sounds good. Here we are with the one, the only, <laughs> not golly, Charlene Amanoff. Hello, so excited to be here. Well, as we start off, most, not most, a lot of people know you as golly because you have a company called Golly's, Golly's Couture, Couture Wigs. It would make total sense for everyone to assume I'm Gali. That is why I have a plaque on my desk that says Charlene Aminoff, CEO, founder, and Gali's mother. Nice. It's mm. perfect. I like that. Gali must feel so special that about your daughter, who you have a company named after. She is, Baruch Hashem, she's a very special girl, and let me tell you, she definitely milks it. <laughs> and it was, it was an amazing thing to be able to dedicate such a wonderful company and mitzvah in her zechut, but it also got me into a little bit of trouble because I have another daughter <laughs> whose name is Aliza, and she came into my room one night and said, so mommy, um, can you make an Aliza's couture wigs, but I don't wanna drown. So my husband and I had to come up with a nice uh, gesture for her, which is why we launched the Aliza collection exclusively for Kitty Chic. No way, that's why. So I said, yeah, that's why. That's the story behind it. So now every time Aliza gets a little, I don't want to say jealous, but a little uh, aware that Gali's getting some extra recognition because of the Gali's couture wigs, we quickly take her to the Kitty Chic stores or online and she sees her face and her name and Baruch Hashem, Shalom Al Yisrael. Balances out. Mm -hmm. So I want to start from the beginning. You were born and raised in Great Neck? I was born in Queens. Oh. I moved to Great Neck when I was a little girl. But actually, some interesting fact about me, I, I come from an extremely loving, delicious, warm, super... I, I can't describe it other than delicious, Sephardi family. It sounds like you like your family. We're obsessed with each other, Baruch That's Hashem. Awesome. And we actually grew up in a teeny tiny two-bedroom apartment in Queens. Four kids in two bedrooms. We had no money, but we thought we were the richest kids in the world. And I promised Hashem that no matter what happens to me as I get older, no matter what situation I find myself in, whether it's Mizrat Hashem with more privileges or less, I will never raise my children with that sense of entitlement because I didn't have that growing up. And I think, I think we did pretty okay. And that's why each of my children have to share a room because Baruch Hashem, they have a nicer home than I had, but we made it very clear that they share a room and they get chores, they get allowance, they have to hustle, they got to work. Uh, Baruch Hashem, I think it's a pretty good system. Wow. Wow. So you, you guys live in Great Neck now. Your husband, Jonathan, he's on the Hatsala there, right? He's a big member he's, in the community. We, 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 it would be easier to name which organization he's not mm. part of or which board he's not on. It'll be faster. So he's not a part of the church. Got it. For sure. Definitely. Not. They asked. They reached out to him. <laughs> he had to humbly decline. So he is actually one of the, I guess you could say, coordinators of Great Neck Hatsala. Um, he's been in Hatsala for almost 30 years. I think that is the coolest thing. And I, to be very honest, I feel like, I hope he's not listening to this. Um, he probably will. But he's totally listening he's to totally this. Listen yeah. Hey, when, Jonathan. Hi, honey. Uh, when I wake up in the morning and I say, Moda'ani, I actually thank Hashem that Jonathan chose me. 
Wow. He is such an extraordinary person, and he's going to be really upset that I'm doing mm. this because he flies away from Kavod and recognition, but he's actually extraordinary. He's on the board of my kids' schools. He's involved with every type of chesed organization, and he's just a super hands-on person, and he's just, he's a guy that if you need anything done, whether it's a ref- to, to find a, a good doctor, to change your tire, if your blinds fell out from the top of the ceiling, you call Jonathan. If you, someone's in labor, you call Jonathan. If someone's struggling to find a job, you call Jonathan. He's just, he's that guy. And I'm so lucky that so he picked me. There's many things that we're going to get to in this podcast about your life, but I'm curious, how, does, how is it being <clears throat> the wife of an Atsal member? That probably keeps you on your toes. It does. And it also keeps us, it's, let me, I have a very funny story to tell you. I was his biggest, I am his biggest cheerleader. And I'm the first one to push him to go on a call. The second his, his walkie talkie beeps. And I found that the more calls he goes on, the easier things flow in the house. Wow. Because as soon as he runs out, I turn to the kids and I say, guys, I'm all alone. Yalla, everybody showers, bedtime, homework. And it's a beautiful thing. But beyond that, I actually, he's delivered more children than I have. So it's really great. That's very Isn't funny. that cool? That's very um, funny. And two of my deliveries, he almost didn't make it to mine because he was busy delivering others. Oh my gosh. And those were my two fastest and best babies. So oh, I told him, I think it's a Segula to go on someone else's call instead of being with your wife during time of need because somehow Hashem just makes it work that I didn't even need him. So wow. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, similar to, I, I guess, your backstory about, you know, growing up a certain way and now now being a different way, w- w- you know, you have five children and Our someone children. looking at your story is like, okay, great. You know, things are going smooth, but that wasn't really the case. I am the perfect example of if Hashem tests the ones he loves, he's clearly obsessed with me. <laughs> I, I talk about this only because I know that every time I speak about my infertility struggles, it helps so many women. I actually had 11 miscarriages, which wow. is a, a hefty pill to swallow. But Hodul Hashem, I'm also blessed with five incredible, delicious, fabulously animated, amazing kids. So... I never look at what my, my I've always been a super optimistic person. I've always looked at my cup as ha- more than half full. I looked at it as fully full, even if it was half full. And I know that I have so much to be grateful for. I never dwell on what I don't have or what I lost. And at the end of the day, we're all in this thing called Galut together, and we all have our fair share of Nisyonot, things that people may not know or may not see just by looking at you. You know, the face value is one thing, but what happens behind the scene is something else. Um, because I'm such a positive person, and especially I like to keep my space, both my actual home, physical space, and the figurative, literal Instagram, social media space, always positive and happy. I don't like to dwell on negative things. I always like to make it a happy vibe. But I have had my fair share of trials and triumphs, but also trials and failures. But Baruch Hashem, Hashem at the end of the day is kol yachol. So to, mar- forward we march. To dig into that that process a little <clears throat> more, I know there's you know a lot of people that have you know trouble having children and stuff like that. They're always looking for the skula or the right schus for them to do. Was there anything specific that you feel like you did that like okay, I think it's because of that. That is an amazing question, and it's not something I always speak about publicly, but I think it is important to know that I, before I had my firstborn, Jacob, who, if you know him, you know that he's the king of my castle. Uh, before I had him, I had a number of very painful miscarriages, and I was told by a top, top, and I put top in air quotes, infertility specialist at Cornell, that I would never produce a biological child. Wow. And he actually gave me two words. He sent me out of his office with two words of advice give up give up could you imagine a doctor telling a patient to give up i mean to me that was the best chizuk i could have gotten because i love proving people wrong when they doubt me and the moment he told me to give up that's when i really began to find hashem at the time i was not keeping the proper um guide i wasn't keeping the proper mitzvot of tzniut i was wearing pants and living very comfortably in my way of serving hashem which was obviously the wrong way. And the moment I heard that, I turned to Hashem and I said, at this point, I realize that Hashem, there's only one ultimate doctor and that's Hashem. So I started to do soul searching, gadol hopping, bracha hopping. 
and I received a bracha from two big tzaddikim to stop wearing pants, and that Bezrat Hashem, that should be as a chut to have a, a, a baby, a biological baby. The month that I threw every single pair of pants out of my home, I didn't even want to give it to friends and family because I didn't want to make a fellow Jew wear them. Go big or go home. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, I'm a very all or nothing person to a fault. It's always like black and white. There's no gray. And I decided I'm going to just throw every single tempting article of clothing out of my out of my out of my house. I gave it to my housekeeper. She was leaving for the weekend. She I, wasn't Jewish, just to clarify. Totally not Jewish okay, cool. and totally grateful for this insane new wardrobe she just acquired. And the the same month that I threw out all of my pants was the month that I was this Baruch Hashem blessed to find out that I was pregnant with my Jacob. Wow, wow. that's amazing. Nine months literally to the day that I called those tzaddikim was his brit milah. Wow. Is that nuts? That is like storybook. I'm telling you, material. people think the Gali story is the first chapter in my book. It's actually chapter 26. I've got <laughs> volumes before that. Wow. So moving on to chapter two. Uh, <laughs> no, I don't know what chapter two is. But um, the Gali story, I, I know you've <clears throat> spoken about it before. So we, we definitely, to do a podcast with you and not bring up that story. It would be a disservice to It the would world. be a disservice. So could you tell us a little more about 2010 Tubav, I think? Tubav, which is to date my favorite day of the whole year. Uh, we have a summer home in Miami Beach. For those familiar, we are at the Green Diamond. So shout out to all my green green and blue diamond girls. And my husband, is, you know, since he's a Hatzalah member, he has what I call bionic hearing. He could hear an emergency from a million miles away. <laughs> he's in great neck now and like <laughs> listening to this podcast. Yeah. From there. <laughs> I actually have the worst reflexes known to man, which, and he has the best reflexes, which is exactly why we're married. Nice. I've actually seen my children fall down the stairs and I was standing a few feet away, but I become paralyzed and shocked and I can't do anything except scream, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And my husband actually observed it once and he said, Shar, you know if you just walk over to them and put your hand out, you will stop them from falling the, the rest of the flight. <laughs> I can't though, and that's he's amazing. Uh, so having this power, this superpower of, of hearing, he heard on July 26, 2010, which was Tuba of, he heard some screaming by our pool. We were already on the beach with the boys. And I had left Gali with my housekeeper by the pool. And she was sound asleep. And my baby Eliza was upstairs with my mom because she was only an infant. And it's, you know, July in Miami is 6,000 degrees. <laughs> so as soon as my husband started to recognize some type of urgency by the pool, he looked at me and he said, there's a, there's a problem. Someone needs me. I'm going to go. And I looked at him and I said, you're not on call. It's in Florida. It's not, it's not great neck. Don't worry. I don't hear anything. So, you know, he turned to me and he said, well, you don't have the best reflexes. So I don't really trust your hearing. <laughs> so he decided to go check it out anyway. I guess moms just have this intuition. I think the Bina is really true. Mm. I sensed that something was wrong and I just decided to follow him with my sons and we all approached the Green Diamond Pool at the same time and at the time I was not yet covering my hair. I had already conquered skirts in order to have my first, my firstborn and with each pregnancy and with each baby that Hashem blessed me with, I gave another part of me. I gave my, you know, I gave... I stopped wearing sleeveless, I stopped wearing uh, short sleeves, and I was really toying with the idea of covering my hair when Gali was born. But being the wife of a CEO of a big hedge fund, it really didn't fit into our lifestyle. Mm. So we kept putting the hair covering concept on the back burner until Tuba of 2010. That was the day that Hashem decided it was time I re-put it back in front of me as a priority. And Jonathan approached the pool and he saw a man standing in the middle of the pool, holding the dead body of a little girl. And he began to scream to the man, I can help you, I can help you, I'm a medic. And the man is screaming for help, call 911, somebody help me. And right then we approach and we see a man standing with his back to us and there's a dead girl lying in his arms. And I can see from where I'm standing that she's completely gone, pulseless, blue, for the rest of my life, I will not forget the way her fingernails looked. Her nails were purple. And a ragged doll looking up at Shamayim, eyes wide open, but completely gone. What, what looked, did you feel? I'm, I'm, I, I heard I, you say the story, so I kind of like, I've always had like, quite like, what was your feeling? I right didn't then know that it was my daughter yet. Oh. That was, it was this whole 
Gehenna was playing out in slow motion. And my husband is screaming to the man, sir, turn around, I, I can help you. And as the man begins to turn around, I start getting this feeling in my stomach, like, why does she look so familiar? Why do I feel like I've seen this child before? You, you, didn't, think, you didn't think that it, it was even a possibility when this is all happening. It not, didn't, didn't cross your mind. Not in a million years. I was, I was so positive that I have no idea who that child is because this could never ha- possibly happen to me. And the moment this man began to turn around, something in my heart told me to look for my daughter. And I quickly looked to see where I left Gali sleeping. And I see Gali's not there, but my housekeeper is sleeping. Mm-hmm. In what I can describe as Mamash Gehenum, my reality unfolds when I see this man is holding my girl, my little, my, my precious princess. None of my children came easy to me by any stretch of the imagination. I had to literally beg, b- plead, and cry and sob for each and every one of them. And lo and behold, I'm faced with the reality that my first daughter, I feel like she broke the curse of boys. Chasa shall not curse, but there's only mm. Amanoff boys <laughs> in our line. Nobody had a girl. I was the first to have the girl. And I am watching her lying completely dead in this man's arms. And I had a total paralysis. I had a head to toe paralysis. I was numb. I couldn't fathom. I couldn't understand what was happening. This fog sat on top of me and I had no clue what was going on. All I remember was Jonathan was screaming, golly, don't you dare leave daddy. And he began performing CPR on her. I feel like till this day, I I don't know why I feel like this is the most traumatic image I've ever seen in my life. And I really, Davin, that no one in Claudia Estrella should ever witness CPR being performed on their child, ever. I know that every single time I close my eyes when I go to sleep at night, I'm haunted by the image of her lying dead, purple, blue, with no pulse. Bezrat Hashem, when Mashiach comes, I will be healed. But until then, this is a this is something that I live with. And Jonathan began pumping CPR into her body and screaming and all of a sudden, this Pasuk from Tehillim began flashing in my mind, which is really, really very in line with my life because although I didn't grow up from, I grew up extremely, extremely spiritual. My mother walked through the home and just shouted, thank you, Hashem, begged Hashem to continue blessing her with so much bracha. And if you look at it on paper, what was she so grateful for? We didn't even, you know, it was just a very Baruch Hashem, amazing, but average life, and to say the least. But she was so grateful and she made it seem like we were so blessed that we thought we were, we knew we were. So she said to Hillim, round the clock, through the night, and that's how I grew up and that's what I did. So although I wasn't keeping all the mitzvot yet, I was finishing Sefer to Hillim every few days, every two days, three days. It was my total solace, it was my therapy. That to Hillim came to save me because the moment I found Gali on the floor with Jonathan performing CPR on her, this pasuk from Tehillim began flashing in my mind, almost like those neon signs you see when a store is open and it's flashing open, open. It was a neon banner, and the pasuk was Karati b'cholev aneni Hashem chukecha etzora. I realized I know where this pasuk is coming from. It's from Perik Kuf Yutet in Sefer Tehillim. Fun fact, when Gali was born, she was born on Shavuot, and I was trapped in the hospital a three-day Chag with nothing but my tears soaked and torn to Hillim. So in order to, I don't want to say kill time, but to keep myself busy, I was, you know, finishing Sefer to Hillim as many times as I could because of Shavuot. But one of the times I decided to calculate the gematria of her full name, Avigail Chana, and I said, okay, Hashem, I just had a girl after two boys after I was told by a top doctor that I would never have children. So as a thank you to you, Blinada, I will say Perik Kuf Yutet, number 119, equivalent to her name, every single day for the rest of my life. As a thank you, Blinada. This pasuk was from Perik Kuf Yutet. That's why I recognize what it meant. Karati v'cholev, I cried out with all my heart. Aneni Hashem, answer me Hashem. Chukecha. At Sora, I will keep your ways. And I literally stopped and I looked at my body and I saw, I'm not keeping your way, Hashem. I'm keeping my way, the convenient way, the wrong way. Without a moment's hesitation, I reached for a blue shawl that somebody had accidentally left by the pool. And I raised my right arm up and I started to scream and sob. And I took that blue shawl and I wrapped it around my gorgeous, thick, long blonde hair, symbolizing the very, very last day of my old life and the very, very first day of my new life. I threw a towel over my shoulders, telling Hashem, 
I am not doing this to, to negotiate with you to get her back. This is yours. I've owed this to you my whole life. This belongs to you. It was not contingent upon her survival. It was, here you go, Hashem, for you. While I rapped and I screamed and I sobbed, my husband was still doing CPR. He seized for a second to stop doing CPR to Davin because he recognized right away what I just took upon myself. And it wasn't, it wasn't temporary. It was Olam Va'ed, a one-way street. My hair and my body will now be serving Hashem the way he deserves to be served. And the moment my husband looked over at me and saw what I'm doing, he began to dive into Hashem and he promised Hashem that he will give another 20 years of service volunteering for Hatzalah so that we should both be giving korbanot and it shouldn't all be on me. The moment he finished his promise for 20 more years on Hatzalah and I finished tucking the last strand of hair into that shawl, that is the moment HaKadosh Baruch Hu, in his infinite kindness returned Gali to us and Jonathan was Zoha to find the pulse in her tiny little body. Oh my gosh. I can't even, I can't even imagine. Like you just said so much and uh, the emotions that I'm feeling, I'm sure you're feeling the same thing. I can't imagine what you're feeling, but to live that, to go through that. And then can you, can you just take us into like what those emotions were in the moment? There's a lot happening. I, I think that I thought that I was going to die myself because as a mom, as a parent, as, as someone who would do anything, would catch a bullet for a child, to see your child like that, you don't even want to think about life without them. And I kept thinking to myself, my life is over. My life is over. I actually kept trying to wake myself up from the nightmare. I've actually had nightmares before and I was successful in waking myself up from them. And you wake up and you're just sighing relief and you cry You're so grateful that it was just a dream, a bad dream. And I remember on that day, I kept saying, Hashem, please let me wake up. Please let me wake up. And I wasn't. And it was so terrifying. I, it aged me. I always joke that I'm 38, but I've actually lived about 80 years worth of life. <laughs> you know, that, pe- people could live 85 years and that will never, you know, Mirza Shem should never happen to anybody. Amen, amen. For nobody in Kali Israel. But that was, that what, as much as it was painful and as much as it was terrifying and so traumatic, I thank Hashem every single day for that day because I am where I am today in my life and I'm serving Hashem the way I am now because of that. And if I didn't have that, who knows where I would be today? Do you still have that shawl? I do. Yeah. I have it actually framed. I was going to say, if you have it, you need it. There's one lady is. right now in Miami Beach just saying, I left the shawl here in 2010. I actually it's tried finding her. You're going to in a certain way. If no, okay, okay, okay. By the way, you're not joking. One of my kids told me, Mommy, we were learning about Hashava Zaveda, oh, no. and they said, Mommy, I think you should set out to find the owner of that shawl. And I tried, but we didn't find her. So I spoke to some tzaddikim, and they said, pretty pretty sure you can just keep it and right. put some, you know, put some money in Staka and her zakhut. So we did that. Wow. So, so you have a frame. It'd be pretty it's amazing framed. to find her though because she's know. part of that story. You Wait, know, she... So, so if you were sitting at the Green Diamond Pool on the east side on July 26, 2010 and you left your blue pashmina shawl, please reach out to me. I will be so happy not to give it back to you, but I will pay you for it. <laughs> I'm keeping that forever and ever. Um, wow. It was probably, you know, you heard like these type of stories. It was Mashiach's wife. A hundred percent. You know, that's, that's who we put it there at the right time, the right moment. As this is all happening, mm-hmm. your, your other kids were there with you? Oh, yeah. So Jacob was there, your son? And Jacob was there. Zachary was there. Jacob it, was six. Yeah. Zachary was four. And I, I think it was a very, very, they were very, imp- it was a very impressionable age. And it left an extreme PTSD situation for both of them. Baruch Hashem. All is well that ends well. We're okay now. But it was a very, very hard two years post-trauma. Um, they both saw their father attempting to bring life back into their little sister's body. And for a 60-year-old and a four-year-old to see that, you know, as an adult, you ha- you carry trauma with you for the, for the rest of your life. Kava Chomer for a young boy. So... It was a little exhausting. They would wake up in the middle of the night screaming and crying, Golly's dead, Golly's dead. And then they would take turns vomiting and then passing out. So wow. we had a very, we had a very challenging um, two, th- two, three years, but Baruch Hashem, everybody's healing and recovering. So I bet that's, that's something that maybe most people wouldn't even think about is besides for the, this, this, such a traumatic episode that took place and 
and on the outside, it really, and in Baruch Shem, it did end well. You know, Gali is how old now? Gali is turning Bat Mitzvah. That's this amazing. This Zayn Sivan, and Chazdei Hashem, she is delicious. She's amazing. She's also a total spoiled brat, <laughs> which she's allowed to be. Anyone in her situation would be, but, right. you know, she, she does know her worth, which I'm very happy, and... The boys are obsessed with her and in love with her, but she does play the drowning victim card once in a while. <laughs> if they're not listening, she'll say things like, boys, I died. And mm. I know that Mashiach is really, really close. Hashem just needs more mitzvot from you. And what you're doing is not a mitzvah. <laughs> That's uh, a little Miss Musser. And, and have, you know, so people maybe not even, don't even think about the effect it could have beyond that, just that day. It's like serious. The PTSD was real. That struggle was real. I personally, I had the worst case of PTSD that the therapist that was working with me had seen in 39 years. Um, He's an amazing, extraordinary man who retired and made Aliyah, but he actually was the one instrumental in getting me to see the pool again because I didn't want to ever see any body of water ever again. And he exposed me to exposure therapy. So I would have to go. We live in Miami a portion of the year and we stayed in Miami for a few weeks after her drowning. I wanted to just pick up, jump on a plane, move away and never ever see my apartment again, the pool again, anything. But he told me that if I do that, I'll never truly heal. So I had to go every morning around Nate's um, to the pool when it was nice and dark first mitzvah of the day I would have to make a bracha that not many people are able to make in their lifetime but I would have to look at the pool and say Baruch she'asali neis b'makom hazeh and I would have to relive everything that happened and I would cry I would vomit I would scream I would I would throw up I would f- you don't even know the scene but after about 13 weeks I started to feel a little bit better, like I can see the water now, but it took about eight months for me to stop vomiting every time I saw water. That is Eight months. I would bathe crazy. my daughter in a, in a special position where I would aim my head onto the toilet while I'm bathing her. Even bathing? That's... Bathing her. If I would bathe her wow. and I would see her hair wet and her eyes open, that would flash back and all of a sudden my mind would travel back to that day and I would remember everything and I would become paralyzed again and vomit into the toilet. My housekeeper would walk into the bathroom and say, I'll shower her. And I kept saying, mind over matter, mind over matter. So yeah, nobody realizes the PTSD from things like this. Would you say that, you know, perhaps you even say that you and your kids and your husband suffered more long-term than than Gali? That's interesting. Yeah, I think when you put it that way, Nachi, cool. I never thought of it that way. Yeah, I think so. I mean, does she, I mean, I'm sure you've spoken to her about this and she mm-hmm. knows about it. Mm-hmm. What's her take on the situation? Does she have, does she remember? She anything? does. She remembers everything, which is very creepy. Really? Because I was like looking at Nachi, like, Nachi, she doesn't remember. <laughs> she she remember Really? So, you know, what happened to her, she actually had the Kabbalistic um, out-of-body experience. She saw the white light. She saw... Wow. How old was she? She w- So, uh, you've met her. Yeah, I'm you saying... You know her personality. No, she's like... Yeah, she's great. She's like 12 going on 44. She's like, yeah. Exa- yeah, she's like... She's far beyond her years. So, she was two at the time, but she was, you know, Little Miss Chatterbox, always very expressive, Baruch Hashem, super bright. And she talks very openly about what she saw. Wow. And she saw a white light. She saw people floating... She says, Mommy, there's so many angels in Shamaim, but they're actually real people. They just don't have legs. Creepy stuff. Interesting. And she says, it's very, very bright. And as soon as she begins talking, we all kind of stop her because I don't think we want to know or we want her to talk about it. Maybe it's something that she should right. kind of keep. I don't know. Right. I hear that. It's a little creepy, but yeah, she likes to, te- she likes to tease the boys about it. She tells them all about Olam Haba and what she's seen. <laughs> <laughs> well, moving forward, you guys, like you said before, you, you, you like to take certain things and put a positive uh, energy into there. Mm-hmm. You started uh, Gali's Couture Wigs. Yes after and what, what was the mindset there? Okay, you're covering your hair right. now, but what's... So at her Seudar Hoda'a, we had some tzaddikim sitting at the dining room table and when they heard her story, she retells her, whole, her own story and she actually pinpoints the exact moment that her neshama was shoved back into the body, which is super creepy. Um, if you're 
if you're a little uh, creeped out by out of body experiences or that stuff, maybe you don't want to listen to this part. They, they yeah. shut this Fast off. Forward. They shut this off ten minutes ago. <laughs> yeah. Maybe press press mute for the next thirty seconds. So at her sit with that hoda, she talks about how she fell into the pool and she was talking from a third person narrative because she was actually above she had her neshama had left her body and she was hovering over and she saw so she talks about it and she says well gali fell into the pool and gali fell all the way down 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 gali sleeping on the floor then daddy grabbed me daddy doing ouchie ouchie kissy kissy and she's actually showing cpr on her own body and then the tzaddikim who were sitting there were awestruck and they said to her the mama miasta and what did mommy do so she looks at me with a twinkle in her eye and she says, Mommy, so silly. Mommy put the blue patu, patu in Farsi is blankie. Mommy put the blue patu on her head and then boom, Kali, wake up. When they looked at me, they said, At mivina, at mivina. And I couldn't understand because I was in that haze. Yeah. I was, my heart was racing. I was getting all anxious. I was about to vomit. <laughs> We like to vomiting. vomit. We like to vomit. <laughs> That's my, by the way, That's that, is, that is my knee jerk reaction to Should've anxiety. Bucket, yeah. Bring a bucket next time. <laughs> um, and right then they told us that she pinpointed the exact moment that not only was my tfi, not only were my tefilot accepted, not only was my tshuva accepted, but that was the moment that Hashem shoved her body, her neshama back into the body. And, she's, and she said this when she, this is a year this after. This is about seven months after her. So she's three. Almost three. And yep. she's saying this. Mm-hmm. So it's not like she was 12 and she was, no. you know, that's... And we have it on video. Um, and the tzaddikim all started calling their yeshivas in Israel and started you know, sharing it. And one one rub was getting a bracha from her. One rub was, you know, calling her. It was amazing. But it was also terrifying because I realized at that moment just how dead she really was. She wasn't almost dead. She wasn't almost gone. She was with Hashem. Hashem had her. He didn't need to give her back to me. But Hodul Hashem, in Hashem's infinite wisdom and kindness, He chose to give her back to me. So, and and I mean, and, and you took from that and to give back to Hashem. You you decided you're going to start this wig company, right? Actually, very much against my will. Um, I was a very comfortable stay-at-home mom, <laughs> super content. Didn't feel I have Baruch Hashem, absolutely no talents. I'm a, I'm a fabulous cook. I'm an amazing, amazing cook. That's it. That's pretty that's much talent. it. That's his talent, right? Um, yes. And I, it is totally a talent, by totally. the way. Totally. I, I don't know how to make eggs, rum, oh, rum bread. No, no, no. You're all welcome to come to yeah, me for Shabbat. I think, yeah, I'll just come for you. Amazing. <laughs> you're all, no, seriously, you're all welcome. I would love to have okay. you all with your wives. We're the best time. How's this week? Perfect. I'm already having <laughs> guests. Come on down. So I literally said to my husband, when the tzaddikim were around the table, they took a legal pad, they passed it around, everybody scribbled a little bracha. That bracha got printed in each wig. Um, so if you own a gali, turn over the pink tag on the inside by the nape of the neck. There's a little bracha on the back written by Gadolim that says, may the owner of this holy shaitel be blessed with protection, bracha, and hatzlacha. Amazing. So that became my little stamp and that's actually what gave me the koach to do this business because the truth is it's not really a business in the term that people think. It's more a project. But we made a promise that everybody who comes to me will leave happy with me and happy with our product, with our wigs. And do you have a lot of customers that come in who prior have not covered their hair but now start? If we've tried to keep track of just how many women began covering their hair because of the Gali story, we lost track at about 8,000. Wow. What's so, so much? That's, that is... You're kind of making me want to cover my hair and I don't even <laughs> no. need to. You know, you, 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 you're both fine. <laughs> I'm sure you guys know what Yaakov and Nachi look like. They are by no means in need of any hair help. <laughs> Baruch Hashem. But um, yeah, we actually... We've been Zoha to adorn the heads of over 14,000 women. The majority of them first-time coverers. So for me, that is the ultimate thank you, Hashem, that I experienced this. You know, I feel like I was chosen to receive this magnificent miracle through hair, specifically because Hashem knew that I'm a big mouth and I'm going to go and spread it far and wide and I'm going to help women recognize the greatness of this mitzvah. Not only the spiritual greatness, but the cosmetic greatness. I mean, come on, you never have a bad hair day ever again. Hmm. Right. And and more than that, even pushing the envelope a, a little more, you guys, you, you started helping people that, you know, whether they have certain illnesses and you... you uh, yes, that is my newest, most, I don't want to say proud, 
but definitely among the most proud projects I've ever taken on. We are now an in-network provider for wigs. So a wig is considered a durable medical equipment. So I filed for four and a half years to get recognized by the top insurance companies, and I kept getting shot down. And I'm not a quitter. I don't know if you know that about me. I am the biggest go-getter, and I like a good challenge. They told you give up, and you're like, oh, oh that's it. Not. That's the best that thing to tell me. <laughs> so I decided that I'm going to drive one day to Albany. I packed up my minivan with tons of snacks, tons of water bottles, a slam and Israeli playlist, and I drove all the way to Albany. And I decided that I'm going to go and have a little chat with the guy who runs the DME department. And I said, the moment I get there, I will blast my spiel. I'll give him my whole deal in like 40 seconds. I had my patent. Uh, we have a patent pending on our ca comfy caps for the medical clientele. And I said to him, I found him. It was amazing. Props to Google Images. That's, that's courageous. Google Images. I knew exactly who to look for. And I stood really? there for about two hours, <laughs> loitering, just being very annoying. And every time somebody came and said, can I help you? I said, no, I'm good. And they couldn't figure me out. And the moment I saw him walking out of it, and I called the office before I went, knowing I knew he's there. The moment I saw him walking out of a boardroom, I ambushed him. And I ran up to him and he sees this crazy lady with, you know, high heels and a full face of makeup and a fancy outfit. And I, I ambushed him and I had my wig in one hand, a clipboard in another and my patent. And I said, you've been avoiding me. I'm trying to get your attention for four and a half months, uh, four and a half years. I just want you to sign on the dotted line and I promise I will leave you alone. I want to become an in-network provider. I want to be able to give women suffering from any type of medically induced hair loss. If a woman is going through cancer treatment, low alenu, or if she has alopecia or lupus, or trichotillomania or any autoimmune disorder, whatever it is, she needs a wig. She needs to feel good about herself. I know that it says in your bylaws you are obligated to provide a hairpiece for this woman. Please recognize me and I will leave you alone. And I handed him my clipboard. He looked me up and down and said, I like your style. <laughs> and he signed. And that drive back from Albany, I FaceTimed every one of my doubters and every one of my naysayers and I held his signature up in front of the camera and I said here you go I got it I got the signature and Baruch Hashem once we got that everyone else just kind of followed suit and Hodul Hashem we now have been doing the insurance business for uh, about four years now and the, the feeling I get when I get a client approved is the greatest feeling in the world and even if they get denied and then I go and I fight and I appeal and then I get them approved oh that's even better mm -hmm. they probably recognize you they know who you are at this point the, yeah? you know what if someone from my team goes and tries to get it and they get denied they call in they call in Charlene and the office knows if Charlene is coming I'm leaving with approved stamps all over those claim <laughs> forms so Baruch Hashem so far so good Jonathan also huge props to Jonathan Jonathan is much more effective on the phone I'm not a phone person I actually hate talking on the phone so I'm more effective in person I'm a little bit more I need to be face to face with someone to make Long, long drives. Yes. Yes. No, but we're, we're good. And um, thank God anybody who wants to know more about that, I, I encourage you to reach out to us because instead of paying out of pocket for a wig, you may be covered for, you know, for a really nice budget by gollies. So check us out. We'd love to help you. That's amazing. Something I really want to talk about with you is the fact that you have, I don't know the exact number, but around 50,000 followers a on little Instagram. Bit less, yeah. You know, maybe at the point that this is posted, you'll have over. Hey, I'm in. Would not be surprised. <laughs> um, I, I'm just curious, what is that? I mean, in the Jewish world, definitely your quote unquote, I hate using the word, but a celebrity, um, definitely in, inspiring tons of women and just people in general. What does that feel like? It's surreal, actually, Baruch Hashem. It's so nice. And to be honest, I love meeting my followers. I think, you know, somebody was asking me, don't you get annoyed? We went to, we went to dinner last night to Chimichurri. Such good food, by the way. Yeah. Oh my gosh, delicious food. This podcast is sponsored by Chimichurri. <laughs> <laughs> it will be now. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and we were sitting there and a bunch of followers came over and they wanted to schmooze and tell me that, you know, they're saying Nishmat Kochai or they started covering their hair or they took upon themselves a mitzvah something or they just like my From Fashion Files or they like the Costco giveaway. And I love it. And one of the the onlooker as one of the spectators said don't you get annoyed you can't even sit and have a normal meal and I said it's so beautiful to me to see that first and foremost it's all Hashem I'm, I'm nothing I'm a nobody this you know this is being the having the fat followers is wonderful but I really feel like Hashem knew that I'm going to use my platform to kind of keep it a positive happy space we're totally anti-controversy anti-drama I just 
take myself out of any negative situation and I remove myself. So my page is a real happy page and to feel that so many women can connect and can be inspired and can even turn to it for something as silly as I had a girl last night tell me that she wanted to wear an outfit and it, it was pants with a really cool top and she, st- and she saw my Insta stories and I was wearing an outfit that she liked and I mentioned where I had got the outfit from and she decided that because of that post, she's not gonna wear that pants and she's gonna go and buy the outfit that I posted and she's going to wear a skirt instead. I love hearing this because I feel like, okay, so 40, whatever, 40,000, 50,000 followers is beautiful, but to touch one person and to make one person rethink a choice that will ultimately bring them more bracha, or bring them closer to Hashem, I love hearing about it. And I hope that Bezrat Hashem, I can continue to grow and continue to help other people reach a better place in their lives, a better version of themselves. And well, I love it. A story that I think about when, when you mentioned this is <clears throat> a personal, I was talking to you and Jonathan and we were just talking about Instagram and stories and the, the a big ability it has to help people inspire them. And you were saying how you're taking like a video of Jonathan. He was, he was about to go running on the beach and he wasn't wearing tzitzis because mm-hmm. he was about to go on a run. He was right. going to get very sweaty. Exactly. And you start taking a video and you're like, wait, where's your tzitzis? He's like, yeah, I'm about to go on a run. You're like, I'm deleting the video. Mm-hmm. Go upstairs. Yep. We're doing this again. We're doing it with tits. How could I have thousands of people watch not wearing, you know, watch you not wearing tits? Exactly. And I'm like, wow, you're really thinking about how people are really like watching you and how they could grow and connect to Hashem. Right. So it, it was actually, he was a fun fact about Jonathan. He actually lives in Miami half the <laughs> half, half the year. He has total dual residency. I, I'm a little bit different, but he was there on his own and he wanted to send me a video of himself jogging because he was announcing a Costco giveaway and it was like a really cute, mm-hmm. funny video. And he sends me a selfie video of himself and I respond back. I'm like, I'm not posting that. Where's your tzitzit? He said, on the lounge chair by the pool. I said, well, go get it wear it and he said honey i'm jogging i'm working out I, I, it's like not covered for the tzitzit to get drenched i said i will not post a video of you without tzitzit on and he's like fine <laughs> so he went he put his tzitzit back on and he jogged with tzitzit needed to have it washed and you know yeah. but I, I i have i feel in a harayut. i feel like people are watching my page and we really it's so interesting because people only see about 20 minutes of my day on Instagram, you know, with the Insta stories, you know, each slide is 15 seconds. The maximum you'll see is 15 to 20 minutes of my day. I really keep the private things private, Baruch Hashem. You know, we gotta maintain yes. a certain sense of, of sanctity, of holiness, of privacy in the home. But one thing I will never ever do, I will never, sh- I will never show a lessening in a certain level of observance on my page because that's not what I'm about. I'm always about growth and I want everyone who watches it to always be growth oriented. And that's why we really try to always make sure that everything I post is mahadrin mina mahadrin. And so far, so good. And you touched you touch upon and people really see just a snippet of your day. It's a, Some people could think they're, they're watching you or anybody else on social media and they, they think, wow, life must be perfect. Right, of course, because that's, what you see on Instagram is the carefully curated content of a person. I have, Baruch Hashem, tons and tons of nisyonot. I, like I said, Hashem really loves me and my, my trials and, and tribulations are plenty. But I don't show the days that my mom is going to Sloan Kettering. Mm-hmm. I don't show the days that, you know, we have to call her oncologist because something something popped up. I don't show the days that um, I'm in I'm in I'm struggling or I'm in pain or one of my children is hurt or you know I actually I started something called it's cool it was a hashtag it's cool to be kind because I was very badly bullied when I was in high, when I was in elementary school really oh my goodness I was shoved into a janitor's closet during a fire drill. And as a seven-year-old girl, you think you're going to burn down with the building. Right. You don't realize that it's a drill. You think that if that alarm, it's a scary alarm. Yeah. And I was in first grade and one of my bullies shoved me into, I had two bullies really. One of them shoved me into the janitor's closet and locked me in there. And I was in there for about two hours and I was screaming and I was crying and I was sweating and it was horrible. And I have a really sensitive place now for bullying. So we started this hashtag called It's Cool to Be Kind. And I go around speaking in schools anti, about anti-bullying. So what you see is Baruch Hashem, happy vibes, positive vibes. But I don't show when a child comes to me and says, 
they were hurt in school or they were bullied or they weren't included in something because I feel like I want to keep my page a happy page and right. something that just sparks sunshine. And But trust me, there's so much that goes on behind the scenes. Baruch Hashem, I'm so, so blessed. I have incredible hakar to Hashem for everything I have. But believe me, I have my fair share. Uh, I think one of the hardest things that I deal with is, besides my mother's cancer, is my father has a heart condition. Because as a result... Uh, as a result of my mother's sudden cancer diagnosis, my father had a massive heart attack. And he used to be a marathon runner, the most fit person you can imagine, best diet, everything. The stress really did a number on him. So stress is totally a killer. And I find myself sometimes also, you know, Baruch Hashem, I like to sign on to a million projects. I'm a doer. Sometimes I find myself getting very stressed and I think, ooh, I can't show this on Instagram. This is a lot, this is heavy. What's your, you know, what's your go-to? You're in a stressful situation. Is it deep breathing? Is it you're going to just shut everyone out? Like, what is... What? I have the secret recipe in my life to dealing with stress, to healing and coffee. I have my own little sacred seat in front of my fireplace in my den. My favorite to him that has carried me through all my miscarriages, all my mom's Sloan visits, all the scans, everything, everything, all my... Um, I had a best friend that passed away the same year that Golly drowned, the same year that my dad had his heart attack, the same year that my mom was diagnosed. It was a very dark year, very, very dark year. My best friend passed away that same year. And I sometimes sit with my Tehillim and I sob and I cry. And also, I really cry for my for the messages that I receive in my inbox. You know, I have so many amazing followers and I receive Baruch Hashem between four and 500 DMs a day. Wow. <laughs> and I struggle with how to respond. And you respond to every single one. I, I try to. I, I'm a little behind right I'll t- now. I'll test, I'll test it tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little behind. I I probably have about a thousand un- unanswered messages right now. I really try to respond to everybody, but I get some messages that there's so much pain in the world. Everybody's suffering. Everybody in some way or another has what to daven for, has something in their heart. And I sit with my Tehillim and they give me their names. I always ask, please give me your name. Let me daven for you. And just before we started this podcast, I said someone just sent me a name and I made a shahakal bizchut or mm-hmm. for somebody. Uh, I really carry Klal Yisrael's troubles and burdens on my shoulders. I don't know why, but I do. I'm just like that. And that's all, all I need. I need one hour with my Tehillim with Hashem, alone, in a room, no noise, no Instagram, no phone calls, no people, and somehow I get the answers I'm looking for. Would you say you have a favorite mitzvah? Question we like to ask. Clearly, I'm going to say hair covering. Mm. In my particular case, I see 100% bevadai that my hair covering was what brought my daughter back. So this is a constant reminder to me that what, what ending I could have had and what ending Hashem in his amazing kindness let me have. So for sure, obviously, the hair covering is the biggest mitzvah for me. I also feel like from a very vain perspective, you will never have a bad hair day again. So (laughs) it's a win-win. Right. You know, you're serving Hashem the most beautiful way. Me and Yaakov are not that lucky. (laughs) All right. (laughs) We have to brush our hair, (laughs) our actual hair. But everybody also, can I tell you, this is by far Jonathan's favorite mitzvah that I took on because we used to get to weddings so late (laughs) because I was busy blow drying my hair or coming out of a salon or getting a keratin treatment or a highlight treatment done. And we would always miss Shmorg. Shmorg is his favorite part of dinner, obviously, of any of any event. And ever since I started covering my hair, you're ready in 30 seconds. You your hair can be sapping wet. You throw on a wig and voila, you're done. You're set. Something that you you've I, I don't want to say you made it cool, but because it's always cool, but you kind of uh, you like plugging nishmas. You're very oh, into nishmas. Oh, my goodness. So my nishmat army is ever growing. We are at 11,000. <laughs> there's 11,000 women Whoa. saying nishmat kochai because of, I guess, my little Instagram page, my cute little family on there. We, uh, Rebetzin Kanievsky is actually the one that started this, Aleha Shalom. She spoke volumes before she passed on how the majority of tsarot in the world stem from ingratitude. It's a very why me society. A lot of complaining, a lot of kvetching. And she said that if everybody stopped kvetching and started recognizing their brachot and counting their blessings instead, shefa and bracha would just overflow. So we were carrying on her amazing legacy. 
And I started something called the Nishmat Kohai Movement, where every person signs on for 40 consecutive days to take upon themselves to say this powerful, amazing tefillah, super short, found in Shachrit Shel Shabbat. You start with the words Nishmat Kohai and you end at the end of Yishtabach. You say the bracha without Hashem's name, 40 consecutive days. It is ideal to be said before Shkia. So in the winter months, it's a little bit more challenging. But as we know, the harder the mitzvah, the greater the schar. So this is one of the things that I'm really promoting because if you look through my Instagram, you look through those Nishmat miracles that I love to post. There are so many highlights filled with miracles of people like you and me who are seeing ridiculously outrageous Nisim V'Niflaot just from saying this tefillah. It wasn't my, it wasn't my brainchild. I'm carrying on the legacy of Rebbe Kanievsky, Aleha Shalom. But I feel like in this day and age, I see it with my own eyes that so many people are ungrateful. And I just want to stop and say, stop fetching, zip it, just say thank you, Hashem, which is also, by the way, kind of in line with the whole thank you, Hashem, my Hodul Hashem slogan. Mm-hmm. My Hodul Hashem is probably my most hashtagged ver- term. Uh, is that how you really say it, though? Hodul Hashem? Yeah. I don't think I remember that's how you yeah. say it. Hodul Hashem. I, you say it more, more, with more vigor. No? Hodul Hashem, <laughs> ki tov, ki lo olam chas do. That, yes, that's, that's I how you recognize it. it exactly. <laughs> so I feel like, Right now, if you're listening to this and you have anything in your heart, take upon yourself, Belina, there, to try to do Nishmat Kochai for 40 consecutive days. Feel free to DM me. I'll hold you accountable. <laughs> and this way, you're just, you're kind of stopping a negative uh, downward spiral and you're creating a major positive force instead. And Bezrat Hashem, I'm sure you will see a lot of Yeshua. Wow. Something I, we also often like to ask our guests is do you have a favorite Yom Tov? I have a least favorite Yom Tov. Oh, interesting. What's the <laughs> least favorite? That's so bad to say. This is horrible. Okay, no. All Chagim are amazing. Right, of course. All Chagim yeah. are holy and wonderful, and I love every element of Chagim. Period. Next chapter. Purim gives me major anxiety. Why? Why is that? A lot of, is which, just, means, which means a lot of vomiting. It's, like, <laughs> <laughs> it's just a very overwhelming chag because Baruch Hashem with five kids, nobody agrees on a theme. Mm-hmm. I'm not, I don't even like the whole concept of a theme. I would love to just let one of them dress up as a cowboy, one of them be a broom, one wants to be a banana. You, know, you say fine. a broom? Broom. I kind of want to be a broom for <laughs> Purim right <laughs> yeah, now. That's yeah. awesome. Be a broom. Be the, I'll be the dustpan. <laughs> yeah. We got this. That'd be great. <laughs> You know, every child has their own little wants and needs for Purim. And then all of a sudden, someone decided it would be cool to do Purim themes. Who are you? Yeah. Who are you in the world? You I ruined it. I think it was it. the same lady that left the shawl by the pool. <laughs> yeah. I think once we find her, we have a lot She's to the talk culprit. about. Right. Oh, for sure. So I just, Purim overwhelms me. I wish I could just have every child dress up as their own little thing. And they don't want to. They want to do a theme. So we sit at the Shabbat table for hours on end from months before, painstakingly co- convincing each other to be something, to be you know, a, a doctor, a family of doctors, a family of firefighters, nobody agrees. So literally like four or five days before Purim, everybody just, Baruch Hashem, it all comes together, <laughs> but man, is it an overwhelming this, chag. This is why so many dudes are lawyers. Each kid has to have, make their case telling you, why we should be this and why uh, we should be that. Ladies, if you want to join my Purim support group, <laughs> let's do it. I, I, I totally agree with what you're saying because there's also, I, I, there's a few mitzvahs for the day and often we, we tend to, you lose focus and like the world or maybe maybe it's American society like says okay this is the this is like the what you should be focusing on like Michelle Chmanos it's one of the mitzvahs oh but I think we all go a little too a little, crazy on it and and it's hard because you don't want to insult anyone oh for sure but you want to be out to the mitzvah and it's it's, you it's, like, do, it's like cleaning for pace like also yeah the, oh for sure you don't there's, need a toothbrush there's certain <laughs> things about like Yom Tovim and it's usually like the baggage that comes with the Yom Tov. it's not even the myth the mitzvahs are amazing right. it's just the culture that we've put around so, it so the interesting thing I think part of the reason that Purim overwhelms me is because I'm an extreme davener I am like if I could daven 20 four hours a day, I will daven 24 hours a day. Baruch Hashem, my life's a little too hectic for that. I try <laughs> to daven with as much as I can, but every spare moment I have, I'm davening, or I'm saying to him, or nishmat, or, by the way, what time is it? Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> um, so I find that Purim for me is overwhelming because all I want to do is take advantage of the holiness of the day. <laughs> Tfilot on Purim are, whoa, lamala min hateva, and it's lost in the shuffle and the chaos of, the, the kids overdoing the candy consumption and the sugar highs and like the men who get a little carried away with the alcohol and it just because 
I want to sit with my tehillim and my aneni and my sitter and my tefillat chana and my nishmat and my tikkun haklali and sit and daven all day long. But you can't because you got to go from house to house. So right. You want to make Purim great pictures. again. Like, oh, <laughs> hold it. on. What is that? Let's do make Purim great again. MPGA. Guys, come on. Let's, pre- let's pre- send this trending. I'm pretty sure Trump will sue us, but <laughs> <laughs> we could take a shot at it. I love it. So, but my actual favorite Yom Tov is a shocking one. I don't know how many, how many people I'm going to have agreeing with me on this. My favorite Yom Tov is Yom Kippur. Hmm. I was born on Yom Kippur. I was born during the Ela. I'm Yud Aleph Tishrei, and mom says, my mom says, the sound of me entering, my, my cry entering the world, and the sound of the shofar blowing was one and the same, simultaneous. Mm. So for me, um, Yom Kippur is definitely my favorite day of the year. Uh, I think if I had to have an actual fun festive Chag, it's a close tie between Sukkot and Pesach. I love Pesach. I love matzah. Is that weird? Yeah. No. <laughs> yes. like Nachi says yes. No. Yaakov says no. I love matzah. Nachi, have you ever had matzah pizza with Munster cheese and fresh herbs? Have you ever had pizza? Like regular pizza? Yes, I know. We love regular pizza also. You know what? So I have to have you over during Pesach for an amazing barbecue a meat barbecue and a dairy pizza fest. Okay. So then, then the you'll start to like, right. we know, we know how to do it. We know food. Okay. Jonathan's a foodie. Right. And actually, if you've noticed, we have some plaques in restaurants. Yeah, in because Fuego. Fuego. We have Fuego has a plaque. Rustico has a plaque. Fuzo has a plaque. And Kosh has a, we couldn't put a plaque simply because there's no walls <laughs> there. So we have a f- picture frame in the bookcase of Kosh instead. But we are putting up a new plaque in a restaurant in New York, which I can't talk about yet, but stay tuned. Are we allowed to guess or we're not allowed to guess? Go ahead. Definitely the loft. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah? Can't comment, but that's okay. a good one. Chimichurri. Chim- you know what? Chimichurri located on Rockaway Turnpike. <laughs> <laughs> loft Steakhouse is hands down our favorite restaurant in New York. So yes, uh-huh. yes, yes. Loft is going to be getting a, uh, a plaque. And if you ever go to one of our restaurants and see our plaque, snap a pic, DM it to me. We'll do some fun <laughs> things with it. Sounds That's good. awesome. So you have a lot of followers. You I have a lot so. of people on Instagram, a lot of people on social media, a lot of young people. Yes. And uh, we, the, the young people actually found me by something accidental. I speak in a lot of, um, I speak for a lot of young girls, yeshivas, whether they're teenagers struggling with sneas or trying to work on self-worth or just modesty in an immodest world or bullying. And we started something, the Rebbe of a yeshiva, actually from out here, asked me to start something on Instagram called From Fashion Files mm. to show girls that you can look put together and fashionable and in, in total trending and totally look cool while also keeping 110% it's nude. So what my the majority of my young followers always comment, can you do more from Fashion Files? Can you post more of that? I have to work on that. I'm a little lazy with that because <laughs> I'm always running to do something. I don't really get a It's an amazing chance. thing, especially oh, the Hashem. world, you know, teenagers and young, right. young people. And it's an amazing world we live in. And cholesterol is awesome, you know? Yeah. And, you know, maybe some people from other generations will say, well, this generation is so this or so that, but it's really amazing, you know, the the kayak and what these kids have. So your page really, you know, it's on social media. It's there for them. And it, it's great. It, I like to touch upon so many different elements on my page, whether it's if you want a cute, fun, delicious recipe, I got something for you. If you want to just do a quick little mitzvah, I got something for you. If you want to take something life-changing upon yourself, I got something for you. If you want to save 500 bucks off your next golly, I got a Costco giveaway coming for you. If you want fabulous makeup, I got Jade Cosmetics for you. You know, I try to make it fun and kind of catering to everybody, but at the same time, I will always, always keep it real. I will never, ever, ever, and I put that in huge caps lock, bold and italics, I will never endorse a company, a brand, or a product that I don't believe in, I don't use, I don't love. So I feel like I think my followers know that about me. I'm a little picky with who I choose to work with. So Yaakov and Nachi, be a little flattered that I'm here today. Thank you. Kidding. Of course, you guys are amazing. It's really a chut for me to be here. But I think my followers sense that I'm so real, and I think they trust. They trust me, and I will never steer them wrong. Yeah, you definitely have that authentic feel to you. and I'm as real as it gets. And um, as, as, as we close the podcast, something we also like to ask close is... Close this episode, not the entire podcast. <laughs> <laughs> We're done. We, we reached this. This is Mashiach. the last show. You know, hopefully Mashiach's so we, coming. Yeah. Yeah, we have nothing course. else to... That's it. I was the final guest. Yeah. Series finale. <laughs> so um, I want to ask you, uh, is there something about you that people don't know? Because you do share a lot 
My life is definitely an open book. So I do once in a blue moon post something called Fun Fact Friday, where I list a series of really silly fun facts about me. Uh, it's typically when my challah is rising and I have challah baking at my house every Friday. Oh, you don't so, have matzah bake? Uh, <laughs> oh. You know what? That is Jonathan's dream <laughs> to go into the matzah baking business. So if anybody wants in on that, send me a DM. Yes. Um, so I sometimes when I'm waiting for the girls to show up for challah baking, I have like seven minutes and I'm, oh my gosh, I didn't post a post in such a long time. You know, you want to keep the followers engaged. Stories have kind of taken over the feed this, yeah. in this day and age. So all of a sudden I'll say, okay, I'm going to sit and I'm going to post a cute selfie or a cute photo and, and some really silly fun facts. So you could definitely find a lot of very useless knowledge there. But I think if I had to come out with something right now, I would say that um, I speak five languages. Oh, no way. Which, which, okay, one second. Yako, let's guess them, right? You ready? Okay. okay. <clears throat> American. Combined, combined. You um, speak American. You, my husband speaks American. I, I speak English. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I wanted to sound like, you know, the American that I am because that's the only language I speak, okay. American. You don't um, speak Yiddish or Hebrew? Nine and low. Oh, <laughs> no, okay. no, realistically, no. Um, yeah, no, English is not my I'm going language. for a, a wild card one here. Farsi. Absolutely. I am Persian. Yes. Okay. Persian, that's, that was the hard one, probably. Persian that's Persian two. Represent. Got English, you got Farsi. Spanish? Absolutely. Really? Okay. Claro que si. Yo hablo español. Perfecto. How do, you say, how do you say meaningful people in Spanish? Personas importantes. So give, could you give Wait, a message? What is this, all, a test now? <laughs> what are you doing, Nahi? <laughs> could you give all our Spanish listeners a little shout out? <laughs> Let's see. What can I say to you guys? Mm, I want to say something meaningful. I want to say something, in he, something Jewish. I will say, gracias a Dios que yo puedo usar mi Instagram para hacer todos... Uh, buenos and sa siempre con salud in con contenta y feliz <laughs> Leo Lambaer. <laughs> People who just tuned in are so confused. <laughs> Who's tuning in to like 45 minutes into the podcast? Some guys like, you know, I'm sure I'll see what it's about. And Charlene is speaking in fluent Spanish. She, she just said meaningful people is the worst. Stay away. Oh my God. These guys are the worst. And, and she, then like she smiled like, oh. No, and she said, but chimichurri is pretty good. <laughs> sí, es, es delicioso. It's muy bien, todo muy bien. So we got we got English. Oh, hold on, I just need to clarify. My wife's gonna be very upset. The whole when I said American, I was clearly joking. Yeah. Oh my there, god. Do you, do you realize I was joking? Yeah. Yeah, because I need to clarify because my wife so would got, kill me. You got if Farsi, she, English, Spanish, Spanish, Hebrew. Yes, Hebrew. obviously. I'm not gonna guess. I'm not Yiddish. gonna say Yiddish. I'm no, not gonna either. I no, wish. Okay. I wish I spoke Yiddish. I think that would be such a such a good skill to have. Yeah. You know, especially if you're like shopping in. What's the fifth yeah. language? Uh, you're not. I think you're not gonna guess it. Uh, don't say Ger no, German. No, no. Brazilian. Mm -mm. Well, Brazilian is Portuguese. Oh. Okay. Okay. So yeah, now my wife's gonna kill me for that. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, I don't know. I, I kind of give up. Not Should I? Up. I'll say a sentence. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's that's uh, good. Can I, guess, well, can I guess before? Sure. I'm Hungarian. Yo capisco italiano, pero non parlo. It, Italian. Italian. There you go. Oh, I was hoping it was Chinese. And you know what I said? I just said I speak Italian. I, I say I understand Italian, but I don't speak it. But I speak it. Oh. Okay. And you know why I speak it? Yeah. Why? Fun fact. Listen to this. My my mother-in-law, which I love obsess obsess over these I, I don't know what I did to merit to have such amazing in-laws but I have the most amazing mother-in-law and father-in-law and in-laws and everybody my mother-in-law is Italian so when I was getting engaged to Jonathan I was I, I'm good with languages like my brain has like Baruch Hashem I can, I can handle language as well I thought I'm going to teach myself fluent Italian so that I can impress her so I took the Rosetta Stone <laughs> I learned it I took the whole thing f fluent I mean fluent-esque and I met her and I whipped out my Italian and I started speaking to her and she says, oh, well, that's beautiful, but we don't talk, we don't speak Italian in the home. Uh. <laughs> she speaks, but you know, I have nobody, nobody to speak to, but I taught myself Italian just to impress my mother in law and she didn't even need it for me. She likes me enough, Baruch Hashem. Wow. wow. Well, uh, Charlene Amanoff, Toda Lach, uh, <laughs> coming yeah, to yeah, yeah, speak Hebrew. I really thank you so much for, for joining us. Yeah, this is, was my pleasure. Is there anything that you'd like to finish off? Your yes. message? You'd, okay, go I'm going to give a message to everyone, to all the listeners, and I think this applies to every single person in the universe. It is my mantra. It is. I, I like to close every single speech or every single meeting with this, but it's food for thought. Hashem doesn't want you to stress. He just wants you to stretch. That's it. Mm. That's great.
That's, that's amazing. Thank you. We're gonna that, use that, is, <laughs> that should be a bumper sticker and that should be on everyone's car and that should be a constant reminder to everybody that if you're ever stuck in a stressful situation, if you find yourself in a hopeless situation where I found myself very many times, look to Hashem, stretch, give a little mitzvah, give a chudosh al machat and bezrat Hashem, you will have, you will have your Yeshua. We're good. All right. Thank you Yay, so much. Yay, pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening or watching another episode of the Meaningful People podcast. I hope you had as much fun or enjoyed this as much as we did. And guys you and girls, you could also <laughs> watch our podcast on YouTube. All you got to do is type in Meaningful People. Typically, the audio on the podcast comes out first and we have, you know, need a little time to edit the video. But we have all our videos uploaded to YouTube. And if you're more of a visual person, you could watch it. Definitely subscribe on YouTube also. That would really mean a lot to us. And if you're already watching this on Instagram, then hi. On on Instagram. Shoot. Shoot. That's fine. Let's keep it, Nahi. No one's perfect. That's the lesson of this outro. We're not going to do this more than 12 times today. That's We're going to keep it. (laughs) It's all good. If you're watching this on YouTube already, hello. <laughs> hello. Please subscribe. Hit a thumbs up. Tell us what you like about the podcast. And, and make sure any- to share the podcast with your friends. Because why, Yaakov? Because it does good stuff in Shemayim, according to Nafi. <laughs> Enjoy. <laughs>